Um, my name is Joyce Raimondo, and I am the education coordinator here at the Paula Krasner House and Study Center. And um, today we are going to do a combination of a presentation, a brief tour, abbreviated, and also a hands-on workshop where you will get to create and we'll be alongside each other on Zoom, sharing, and so on and so okay. forth. This is so let's get started. Here I am at Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner's barn in East Hampton Springs, Long Island in New York. And um, of course, Pollock, Jackson Pollock is best known for his iconic drip painting, where he was dripping paint from sticks to make 100% abstract art. And Lee is also known um, as an abstract expressionist painter largely responsible for the success of the business end of Pollock's career. And this couple had extraordinary creativity. Today, we're gonna focus on a, an aspect of their work, um, which is collage. And we're also gonna bring in to the discussion Matisse, because of course, Matisse is one of the foremost collage art, artists of modern art. And Lee was very influenced by Matisse. And in putting together this talk, I did notice some similarities um, and comparisons between Pollock's work and Matisse as well. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm going to do a little brief, brief screen share, and then I'm going to take you into the studio behind me where Pollock and Krasner made their um, abstract art, and then we're going to get to work hands on. So okay. here is ja here's Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner, and of course, as I said. He's doing his famous drip painting technique in the barn where he lays the painting on the floor and he's dripping paint from sticks to create abstract art. But this particular kind of abstract art, it's abstract expressionism, it's highly physical. So it's dripping and ripping and staining and letting the paint you know, flow. It's, it's a release of energy. And um, these two artists, well, Pollock in particular became extremely successful in his own lifetime. And after he died, of course, his, his work as well as pa uh, Krasner's work is, is worth millions of dollars. But their real, um, in addition to the monetary aspect, it, their real contribution is really to how they opened up doors for future artists. And it all happened right here in this barn. So um, here's an example of one of Pollock's strip paintings. And you can see it's very large. It's 100% uh, abstract. So he's not referencing anything else. He's not making a picture of a person or a, a landscape. However, his work sometimes is inspired by nature but he's actually capturing energy on the canvas, releasing energy. Pollock and Krasner are action painters because their work suggests movement and action, and it's very evident in the painting. So this is one of Pollock's collages. Now, what is a collage? Mm -hmm. A collage means to adhere something to the canvas. Picasso is noted as the first collage artist in 1912 putting uh, chair caning into a painting and adhering newspaper to paintings. And then uh, Kurt Schwit Schwitters would work with found papers, tickets and things like that, that he would assemble into an abstract artwork. Um, also following, you know, the surrealists would make dreamlike collages where they would maybe take a head of a chicken and put it onto a person and juxtaposed images from printed materials that don't really belong together. But this is different. This is abstract expressionism, right? It's much more expressive, but it also, this particular one suggests a figure. So you could see in this one, the figure is somewhat silhouetted and Pollock would sometimes actually, well, in this case, he glued this figure onto another drip painting, right? This one, he glued the figure um, and then drip paint, you could see painted around it. And also Pollock, which you can't tell in the slide, he would often adhere materials embedded into the paint like sand and broken glass. 
So there's a texture to the materials as well. Now this one is really unusual. It's sort of like a reverse collage where the brown was the underneath surface. And mm -hmm. then he, he laid the other painting on top, the drip painting, you see that? And then mm -hmm. he cut out those organic shapes and peeled them away to reveal the surface underneath. So I wanna hear from you. Uh, who can tell us, what do you see in this painting? What does it remind you of? Matisse the dance. And what makes you say that? It's circular. It's got forms that look like they're in movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Because as I was looking at Matisse, I realized that like Pollock, just like what you said, he's suggesting movement. Right, and Pollock is suggesting movement. The difference is that Matisse, his, um, especially the cutouts are hard edged, whereas Pollock's, the paint is completely, um, you know, what's the word for it? It's dripping, it's splattering, it's painterly, it's painterly. Anybody else on this one? Where am I? Any other uh, ideas that come to mind when you look at this? Cave paintings? Excuse me? Cave paintings, like uh, in France, on the caves? Yeah, it's really interesting how Pollock, um, he's such a modern artist, right? And yet at the same time, his work reminds us of cave painting. Okay, good. And also you might start to see figures and maybe even creatures, fish. Um, that kind of thing, not literal, but suggested. The name of this painting, by the way, is Out of the Web. And this one by Pollock is more of a literal collage, right? <laughs> Where he's cutting, ripping, pasting, painting back into it, painting under it. And at times it's hard to see which part was painted first or which you know it's all sort of layered it, it it sort of merges together at certain points so if you want to do this kind of thing today it's that's really fun and creative to do now at this time in the late 40s and 50s collage was not popular in america the way it is today it was really a very very new art form to make these kind of collages this was really truly groundbreaking and here are some Matisse artworks. And I'm not saying that Pollock saw these or that he copied them, but I did notice quite a resemblance. So here you see, similar to Pollock, the silhouetted figure that's extremely simplified against a background. Um, again, this one also like Pollock, this is by Matisse Jazz Series. It plays with positive and negative space, right? So the black, you could say, is it a negative space that recedes like a hole? Or is it a positive space, a shape that comes forward into the foreground? Does that make sense? Yep. And this one, like someone said, this is also by Matisse cut out. And like Pollock, it suggests movement. It suggests rhythm. And also like Pollock, you have these, this free flow organic, you know, these shapes, but do you notice it's also contained? It goes right up to the edges, but not off the edge. And then you have that rectangle in the background. So these organic shapes are somewhat contained. And in Pollock's drip paintings, you'll notice a lot of times there's this rhythmic movement in his drips, but there's a Space left just around the edge so the energy is contained within that frame. So Lee Krasner is really best known for her collages. Uh, this is when she was older working in the springs here and I put this one in here because you can see the size of the collage. These are monumental collages. So if you ever get to see them in person it is literally a completely different experience. 
And this is a photo by Ray, Ray mm. Eames, the wife of Charles Eames, the famous designer. Um, and this shows Lee Krasner's technique. Similar to Matisse, she would pin the pieces on to the canvas on the wall. Uh, the difference is that Lee, well, there were several differences. In Matisse's case, he had an assistant because he was bedridden. And he had an, his Lee in the studio, and she did not have an assistant pinning the wall. She did have studio. Uh, could someone please mute? Uh, she had studio assistants in general helping her, and sometimes she would have people helping her with things like getting to the store and, and things like that in her older years or driving her to the city. Uh, but she did the actual physical work on these collages. In this uh, these photos, she actually boldly took her former works that she had done years ago in Hans Hoffman's uh, classes and she cut up these charcoal drawings and completely reassembled them in a new way. And so she's literally reworking not just yeah. her ideas, but her actual physical. This is a very good example of when she would actually rip up her old paintings and then reassemble them and paint back into them to create a new composition. This one is called The City. So like Matisse, it suggests a theme, but it's not literal, right? And not only does it convey aspects of the city like crowdedness and maybe it even looks like an aerial view or you can see it in many different ways, it also suggests the emotion and the physical aspect of a city, right? Crowdedness, maybe even it looks like screeching sounds. You can interpret it, of course, in your own way. Uh, this is another one um, made by Cutting, and um, this is called Milkweed. This one is called Bald Eagle. In this painting, she actually took Pollock's drip painting, cut it up, and then reassembled it and painted back into it with various shapes and adding other paintings that she cut up as well. Now, I wanna hear from you. Who would like to unmute and tell us, what, do you, what does this one remind you of? Reminds me of birds chattering and talking amongst each other, especially the one in the center it's, has a fantastic bill. Yes, that one looks almost literally like a, a, a bill or a beak. Anybody else? Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. About defining what you mean by paint back into collage. Does she, he, she do it, you know, all three of them. Did they first glue things down on a blank space or whatever space they're using and then paint next to it, on top of it, halfway, you know, like, what do you mean by that? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm only going to speak about Lee Krasner. I'm not going to, because it's too much to group in. But basically what I mean by that, first off, well, you have two different questions. One is, what do you begin with? So I can't tell for sure in this exact artwork where she began. She may have begun by gluing down black paper and then layering it over. And what I mean by painting back into it is she would literally, let's say she glued some shapes down, then she would take a paintbrush and add paint. Okay, and then maybe she would let that dry and add more collage elements and layer into it. And then maybe she would let that dry and then add more paint. So it's a combination of painting and gluing papers. Does that make sense? Sometimes, like when you look at the image, it's hard to tell which part was painted and which part was cut out. And I'll show you some later where that really is, it just blends together, the edges and whatnot. Including painting over some of the glued pieces, if you want. I mean, anything goes, right? Absolutely. In fact, her very first collage, which was done really early on, I think it was 1938, you wouldn't even be able to tell it was a collage because you can't even see the paper underneath. Um, so here's another example. You can see the edge of the papers on those pink shapes. You see those white edges. But then do you see in the black area, do you see the brush strokes and whatnot? Okay, so it's not like a step one, two, three, 
where you say first make the background, then put the paper on. It's almost like the all it it the paint and the paper kind of interlocks and overlaps throughout the process in various ways. Now this one is by Matisse, and I put these together because I see a similarity here. Okay? Birds, the idea of birds or leaves or nature, things in flight, right? Without being literal. And then we have this one that was inspired by Matisse's trip to Tahiti, right? So what do you see in this one? What do these shapes make you think of or what do you even notice? Fish, sea life. A yeah. lot of exotic plants. Mm -hmm. What I love about this one, and you'll notice this in a lot of uh, Lee Krasnitz and Pollock's work as well, the space is, is always, uh, your eye is always seeing it in different ways. So this could be almost an aerial view, looking down at water and seeing reflections, right? Or you could actually be looking up, seeing birds. But then again, you have that plant life going around the edge, right? As if it's growing upward or downward. So it's almost like you're seeing different viewpoints in one picture, okay? Again, simple shapes to suggest uh, nature without copying nature. This is by Lee Krasner, beautiful. You could see tearing, you could see um, the brushwork. And I just thought this was a striking similarity. This is just my own opinion. I didn't read this in a history book or anything, but this is Matisse's red studio. You see the reds, you see the blacks, you see the pinks. Okay, so you can see they're both colorists, right? They're using extremely bold color to make an entire painting red is very untraditional. This is an example of Lee Krasner's later collage work. And this is what I mean when I say you can't really see where was the first paper and the where did she layer drip back into it? You, it's almost like you would really have to look so up close. Does that make sense? Yep. This is beautiful. She took one of the paintings from her Umber series, which she created three years after Pollock's death and shortly after her mother's death. She had insomnia. She would go into the barn and paint with Umber and Browns because you, 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 know, you can't really see accurately at night in a studio. So she didn't use a lot of color. And she reworked one of these umber paintings to make this collage. These are her later paintings. These are not collages. They're very large scale, but I just wanted to show you some of the similarities to Matisse. This you could say is an all over design that evokes leaves and floral and nature, but it's an all over pattern. And here we have Matisse, right? Mm -hmm. Using shapes. Um, to create an all over pattern that also suggests nature on a monumental scale. This is a beautiful painting Lee did after Pollock's death, where you'd say, well, this, wow, she's bereaving. This looks joyful. Mm -hmm. um, so one could interpret that in different ways. I interpret it as sort of, you know, the life coming back, right? And the, the positivity and life affirming. It's called Some Woman One. But I noticed, again, this is just my opinion, I noticed this striking similarity. Look at the colors, look at the forms. And then you have these colors with Matisse, you have these, the yellow with the pink, the complementary colors, the green with the red, you see that? Mm -hmm. And these colors were highly unusual for the time, right? This is very modern to use these opposite colors like red and green that are so vibrant and bright, right? And also the shapes themselves suggest the emotion. You don't need to literally put a face in there, right? So the top shape might look a little more agitated with the angles and the other ones might seem a little more lyrical. This is another one by Matisse. Are these done at the same time as Krasner's work or are these much earlier or what? No, actually, these were around the same time. Uh -huh. um, 
Matisse was working in France in his older years, the last decade of his life. Mm -hmm. At this point in the 1940s, Lee was a younger woman, right? Um, mm -hmm. But yes, they were working around the same time on in terms of these collages, mm -hmm. not the paintings, the collages. Okay. Um, so here's a painting by Lee, this was done 1971, but again, you see the complementary colors there. You see mm -hmm. the reds and the green and the vibrancy, the simplification, hard edge shapes. I have a question. Yes. Um, did her collage work affect her painting influence? How, were there changes to her painting style after she started doing collage? Or would it be the other way around? I know sometimes influences between mediums can cause changes in style. And it looks mm -hmm. almost like her paintings got to look more collage-ish. But I'm not that familiar with her body no, I, of work. I, I could see your point there. I mean, she. I'm not, I'm, sure, not sure. I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. It's a very good question. I think That's for okay. Lee, she was really constantly evolving right. and playing off of her own work in an extremely bold way. Yes. So. Um, That's very obvious. Yeah, she would literally take her own work, right? And rework it. I mean, most artists do that, you know, creatively, but they don't literally rip it up, I mean, or cut it up, it's really bold. And um, I think this one would be an example of sort of paring down, it becomes the simplification becomes more extreme. And this one shows it's less painterly than her earlier work. Right. 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 This is a, a collage by Matisse. But again, I think there's a clear, you could see a clear uh, connection here in terms of the white space, in terms of the complementary colors, and like you said, the hard edge shapes, right? So here's wonderful, you know, picture of Matisse working on his cutouts with his assistant. And um, actually, I would like to show you a video. Matisse, he was actually using papers that were hand painted. In this video, let's hear what Lee has to say about her work. When it's time to get started, and uh, then when the momentum gets going, when the rapport starts, you know, then, I, then I'm in a work stretch. did a batch of drawings. I had them pinned up in the whole studio. I went in one day, I hated them, and I tore them all up and threw them on the floor. And when I went into the studio again, which was several days later, they looked pretty good that way. <laughs> This seems to be a work process of mine. I'm constantly going back to something I did earlier, remaking it, doing something else with it, and coming forth with another more clarified image, possibly. I don't know. Uh, we'll stop there. If you want to see, I can tell um, when the thing is alive. If you want to see the whole video, it's it's three minutes. It's called "In Her Own Words." It says, "I don't know." Right, she's like this amazing, accomplished artist, and a lot of these artists there's a sense of humility, right? It's a beginner's mind. I don't know. It's an adventure. It's it's highly intuitive the way they're creating. So um, Matisse had arthritis at the end of his life. He was bedridden, and it's just a beautiful, inspiring story. In addition to the art of 
how sometimes in our later years, or if we have a physical limitation, how we can go beyond that, right? So Matisse actually started his cutouts when he was in bed, and these are his finest masterpieces. And it was a completely new art form, as I said, prior to that, he was painting. And I'm just going to show you briefly some of these artworks. This is beautiful to show how a simple shape can express so many things. So take a look at this one. I mean, what does it make you think of? Who wants to unmute and tell us? A peacock. Mm -hmm. Good. I think of seaweed. Seaweed, okay. Anybody else? Ecstasy. Yeah, it's like springing forth, right? Right. Yeah. Now look at this one. When you make your collages today, you always want to keep in mind the positive and negative space. There's no dead space on a painting. There's no unimportant space. So the orange is just as interesting and beautiful as the pink, right? Do you see what I mean? Like in this one, you can't even tell what's the background, what's the foreground, right? So you can see where he cut out, let's take for example, the green, he cut out from the green paper and then he glued that organic shape in the corner down there. But then he used the scrap paper, glued that in the center, the green, and then you could see the black shape, which was the background starts to come forward. Do you see that? So um, even if you're not doing uh, organic shapes like Matisse, you want to keep this in mind when you make your collage. What is the, the, you know, the background or the, especially in modern art, the, there really is no background, right? The, the canvas becomes, um, it's called push-pull where things go forward and back. Um, okay, we'll go a little, this is from J, uh, the jazz series. I put this in here, it was inspired by the circus. You could see they kind of look like acrobats. Um, but I put this in here to show how Matisse is suggesting movement, as we said, suggesting rhythm, even suggesting sound, um, but doing it in a completely different way than Pollock and Krasner. Suggesting nature inspired by nature, similar to Pollock and Krasner without literally copying nature. Although like Pollock and Krasner, he started out painting more, you know, realistically. And uh, we'll end on this one. I love this. This is so positive. Like Lee, Matisse was met with extreme adversity. And yet this is one of the artworks he does in his later years. Lee also was met with extreme adversity, losing a husband when he was 44 years old. And um, she had to work through that, right? And the stress of the marriage and the alcoholism. And um, her later works are also filled with a tremendous sense of resilience and joy. So let's take a little look around the studio and then we'll do some hands-on, okay? We have Pollock and Krasna's studio. I know many of you have gone on this tour. We're not gonna go into the house today because this is more of a workshop program. If you'd like to see the house, come back on another day, go to pkhouse.org and then you could get the full tour. This is a special workshop program, okay? So here is the barn and this is where Pollock made his famous drip paintings, laying the painting on the floor. This is the accidental spills and splatters. This is not a work of art. Um, this is a national landmark because it you know, shows the process of the artist in the setting in which he created his work. And we have historic photos. And this is by Hans Namath. This shows Pollock's technique. Pollock put the painting on the floor. Gravity would pull the paint down and he could work from all four sides. He said, similar to the Indian sand painters of the West, he was inspired by Native American artists who dribbled sand to create their art on the floor. And he also was inspired by the Native Americans when he started in his early work to actually put sand into his paint 
while he painted. Now here we have his paints that he was using, which were enamel house paints rather than art paints. And at times squirting the paint from basters, dripping the paint from sticks, the stirrers, or using the brush as a stick and letting it drip. So unconventional materials and techniques. You can see by Pollock's collages, how inventive he was, right? How in a sense, very playful, even though he was a very you know, accomplished artist, but there is an element of spontaneity and play, especially in abstract expressionism. You know, it's about, um, nobody's teaching you, this is the technique you're going to use. It's about individual expression. So Lee comes into the studio after Pollock's death in 1956. He died in a car crash. He was drinking and driving and his mistress was in the car, Ruth Kligman, as well as her friend, Edith Metzger. Um, for Pollock, and this shows Lee in the studio one year after Pollock's death. They never painted in here together. Lee was in the upstairs room, Pollock was in here, upstairs in the house what I mean. Now, Pollock's alcoholism did not help him at all. He was sober for two years and that's when he made his great works. When he started drinking again, he became extremely depressed and eventually he wasn't even painting the last year of his life and he died in 1956. So this photo shows the people in the barn, in the studio barn where they had covered up this floor with boards. They winterized it and fixed it up. Now, Lee Krasner worked in here. You can see her drips and splatters on the wall. She pinned her canvases to the wall. Unlike Pollock, she did not work on the floor. They're both called action painters because they're moving their entire body as they work and the paint, um, the painting captures their movement. It's very open. Um, so Lee arranged that this would become a national uh, uh, museum and study center before she died in 1984. In 1987, the conservatives came in here and you could see they took the boards off, took the paper off and underneath was Pollock's floor preserved forever. And that's why you don't see Lee's marks on this floor because it had been covered up with boards. Let's get started on a project. So where do you get started? Um, there's no one way, but I'm just gonna give you some ideas. Of course, you're gonna start with a surface. I have some construction paper. I can't get super messy in here because it's a national landmark and I wanna keep my job. So I have some construction paper. And then I figured just for fun, I just sort of randomly got some, like Lee, I got some paintings that I did from my different class demonstrations. So I really don't know what I'm gonna do with these at this point, okay? Now, I also have some solid papers. Oh, here's another one. Wish me luck. So let's see. Now you can start off with a theme, which is content, like let's say, you say, I wanna make a picture that tells about the feeling of spring or depression or the feeling of emerging, right? You could have a theme or you can just simply work with the visual elements with no particular theme in mind, right? So I think sometimes it's easier to have a little bit of a theme for people. So I am going to work on the theme of spring and emergence, okay? So I'm going to have this nice vibrant, what I'm going to do is I'm not just going to lay out a lot of little shapes here. I want it to have um, a little bit of a sense of containment since it is about emergence. And I'm just making this up as I go along. So I am going to take my paper here. You could rip, you could use scissors. Today I'm going to use scissors. So let's say, I make a shape like this. And 
And I like to use irregular shapes, similar to Matisse. You'll notice when he made rectangles, they weren't perfect rectangles. So I could either use the paper like this, this negative shape to frame it, or I could do this, right? The positive. So I think I'm gonna go with this. I am not gonna glue anything yet because um, I might wanna change this around. Now I'm gonna sort of break this up. So like Matisse, I have my paper here and I'm gonna make a shape. You'll notice when Matisse, by the way, when he made those organic shapes, they had some angles in them, which gives them, I don't know, it just gives them a nice rhythm. They weren't completely smooth most of the time. See what I mean? So now I have, again, I have two shapes, right? So maybe I'll put this over here, right? Or maybe I'll even put it down there. Now, by overlapping, I actually created three shapes. That's black one, the yellow one, and then the blue. And then maybe I'll put this over here and I'll sort of play around with that, okay? Now, let me take one of my old paintings and see what I can do with it. I'm gonna use this one since it does have the drip in it. I have no idea what I'm gonna do with this. So maybe I will rip it so I don't get too bogged down. And now I could see, well, where could I put this? Maybe I could put it, maybe I could put it over here to su suggest the idea of things coming out. Um, I don't usually glue until maybe not the very end, but towards the end, because I might completely change this up. Right? I might decide I don't want this here. Maybe I want this. What kind of glue do you use? Um, I use a basic school glue like this. Uh -huh. and I'm not exactly sure what brand or anything Lee used, but I think she used similar to like a liquid glue like this. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. You could use a glue stick is fine. I mean, if you're very serious, of course, you'll want to use archival materials. Would anyone like to share like what materials you have or any ideas? I'm using a painting that I hate. Very good. I love it. Okay, anybody else ripping up something they hate? I, I'm... I have unmuted, but I don't know if I'm on the camera or not. Um, I like to sure. use leftovers. Leftover from what? Well, like this is a, a leftover hemp book from um, drawing. It's a good surface then with some texture in it to start a collage. Very good. Yeah, excellent. Sometimes you get uh, really good creative surprises that way. Uh, I have a... Um a watercolor page that I um, I did a week or so ago, and um, I'm just playing with cutting it up and tearing it and seeing where I'll go with that. I like that. That's good. Do you have any other materials other than the one painting, or? Yeah, I have some. Uh, I use a lot of vintage photographs in my collages, but I also have like origami paper in a lot of colors. Mm -hmm. um, very good. Uh, you, yeah, that's, no, I like that. Now, when you're using photos, sometimes you, you want to, in addition to like what the story in the photo is, you also want to sometimes see the visual element of the photo. So let's say if the photo, everything is vertical, right? You might want to 
put that as a visual vertical element in there, right? Right. Yeah, so you wanna use that, that's the part of the fun of collage is playing off of the, the elements that are in the actual image itself, like line, right. shape, and color. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, anybody else? I um, have a mechanical question. Yeah, is that Janet? Yes. Okay, great. How do we get on? I have um, children. Okay. And uh, grown-ups that oh. they, they all want to turn into. I love it. So you, you're you working, that's an example of you're working more with content, right? You have a story, yeah. there's a narrative in yours. That's right. Okay. So um, now you have to come up with an idea of how you're going to show this theme of, of either fantasy or transition. How right. are you going to communicate that? That's your challenge. Right. Now you could add drawing elements, you could add other shapes, you could add thought bubbles. Yeah, I don't know. You could add question marks. You could add symbols. It depends on how literal you want to do it. Okay. Follow what I'm saying? So yours is going to be more of a narrative storytelling collage. Mm -hmm. Okay. A little different than Lee and Pollock. This was more abstract art. Okay, right. Okay. Should I make it more abstract? I'll make it no, more abstract. No, not at all. I like it. It's a good example of variety. This is totally open-ended. Good. Thank you. Anybody? Hello? I have uh, a question. Kathy. Uh, it's kind of a mechanical, but I have 50 years of, of bad drawings mixed in. I've separated them, but is there an issue with the weight of the different papers and the different photos? Do, if, they're, if they're different um, thickness, is that a, a problem? Or should you find something that's all kind of similar in in the thickness of the paper? Well, that's a good question. Um, now, if you wanted to get super technical, you'd have to ask a museum or gallery conservator. But in general, you would want whatever you surface you're gluing onto to be heavier than the thing you're gluing. Right. right. And then and you then be the appropriate glue for that item. So like, for example, photos sometimes curl up. So you might. Yes. You need a stronger glue. You might need, even need to seal it on top, right? What, what, what would you seal it with? Just a matte medium or something like that? Yes. And you want it, if you want it to be archival, then of course you have to look into that. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Um, okay, I'm going to chime in again. Hi, Linda. I have. <laughs> I had this painting that I was experimenting with that I hate. So I was going to use this as base. Uh huh. And then I had a bunch of photographs of like animals from the jungle and like birds and elephants. And so I was going to put these, I cut these up. And then I have some watercolors and some little drawings I did, and I'm going to cut those, them up. That's really so, fun. Now, are you going to make it sort of realistic where there's like a place and animals or it's just going to be more like abstract design? Um, maybe like a cross between the two because I'm going to show that it's a bird. I'm not going to chop it up so much that you can't tell it's a bird or an elephant. But I'm going to have it uh, sprinkled all over with these other things that don't make any sense. So it'll be, um, but I'm going to stick with like animals and then all these different hodgepodge of, of shapes. Yeah, it sounds good, it sounds good. And, you know, think about how you're layering the animals. Um, for example, you might want to not just put them directly onto the canvas, you might want to put another paper behind the animal so it's contained or overlap. Play, remember how Lee played with overlapping in a variety of ways? So you don't have to have everything like next to each other. Play with overlapping. Does that make sense? It makes sense, thanks. Anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna leave you to your piece. 
And I see someone has a question in the chat. Does anybody know of a good archival glue to glue canvas onto canvas? Can anyone answer that question? If so, you can put the answer in the chat. I do know, I forget the name of the company. You know, I would suggest to go directly to a company that sells archival materials. On, you know, look it up on the web. And uh, also, um, book, book binding companies have supplies that are archival. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, of course, for the gluing and the technical aspect, we're not going to get too much into that. But of course, it's good to have an area. Uh, separate from your collage, um, like even a scrap paper or something, where let's say, let's say if I was going to glue this, move this away, I want to be able to get the glue right off the edge, right? But then my table's going to get all messy. So I might just put a scrap paper there, put the glue right off the edge and then throw that scrap paper out and start with a fresh one or move it someplace else. You, does that make sense? You, you don't want to, if you, you can't really, you got to, if you want it to be completely glued down, you do have to go off the edge of the shape. I have a question. Sure. I'm going to be uh, gluing onto uh, a canvas that has acrylic paint on it. Do you think I'll have a problem making this stick? No, no. What kind of glue are you using? I'm using like the Elmer's glue type of stuff. No, that should be fine. <laughs> uh, just go, you know, like I said, just go completely off the edge of the item you're gluing. And, um, and then you can take a separate piece of paper even, put it on top of, lay it down on your canvas. You can take another piece of paper and then you can, um, you know, smooth it, right? And then it should be nice and flat. Acrylic is just, it's plastic. It usually glue adheres to it. It should be fine. I, know I told you to smother the glue through the whole shape, but I can't really do that in this space. I don't have enough room. So I'm just going to tack it. Now, if you have paint, you are welcome to paint back into it. So, for example, on this painting, maybe I'll do a little drip painting for fun. Anybody have anything they'd like to share? Oh, wow. Oh, you were working with the watercolor. Yeah, yeah, move it over. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very nice. Okay. Can you describe it a little? Because it's not a move it closer to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the big water, the larger piece of watercolor paper, I, I cut Matisse style in, in circles. 
And then I'm um, layering some other colors of paper underneath. And then this photograph will be sort of at an angle here. Yeah, I like the way you're interlocking the shapes. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Very cool. Anybody else? In here. <laughs> oh, I'm, using my, I'm, I'm using my glue stick just to stick it down so I can hold it up. Yeah, well, really beautiful. Tell us about that one. Well, this this was a bubble painting I did on a hard surface, and I'm putting stuff over the top of it. Yeah. But I'm I'm using some transparent papers that have color to try and have see what happens when things come through the transparent. Yeah, I like that. That's a nice technique with collage as well, using layering of translucent papers, and then you could even draw on top of it or. Right. Yeah, and that creates depth also. And I can still move this stuff around. I just thought I'd get it because it does. <laughs> yeah, I think you have a really nice beginning with all the translucent and some of the paint looks like it's a little stained and you have hard edges, you have soft edges. So you have a lot of interest there. And thank you. I think it helped to start with something that was already okay, but not finished. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what's fun about this technique. It gives you a starting point. You're not staring at a blank canvas, right? I'm, I'm having fun. I've got a lot of stuff here. And okay. by the way, I just want to thank you. This is my first time joining you. I'm in um, Arlington, Massachusetts. Wow, it's so nice to meet you. You have a beautiful- I have no idea how I come across this thing, but um, uh, I adore Lee Krasner. Like, she's my- one of my favorite painters. I think she's got an amazing story. So. She's an amazing story. And honestly, I grow more and more appreciative of her. Oh, yeah. So long she was under the radar and she's yeah. an extraordinary artist and extraordinary woman. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, this has been really terrific. So thank you so much. And oh, I it's a pleasure. these days. Um, Joyce, I have a question for you. Joyce, I just wanted to tell, say that I participated uh, a month or two ago when you did the Lee Krasner only um, tour and inspiration. And I did some collages a la Lee Krasner and um, I got a lot of really great reactions from them. They were, they were a lot of fun and uh, it, does, I, it does sort of remind me of uh, the, um, just things that are growing in the yard, the garden. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. really beautiful. It reminds me a little bit of one that Lee Krasner made where it, it had a lot of vertical elements and things. Right. Really good. I also, I also sew my collages on the, on the sewing machine to get some extra uh, texture in here. Yeah. How much of this paint versus um, collage pieces? I'm sorry? How much of it is paint? Um, an, in tandem with your collage pieces? Um, the collage pieces they started out as watercolor paintings. I um, see. Also non-objective abstract. And yeah. then I just tore, I just saved the green one and tore up the other one. And you painted in between, you added in paint? No, or? I didn't add any paint, but oh. I added sewing. Oh. I added some uh, stitches from the sewing machine. Yeah. I you, like that. Yeah. Well, that's a good example. Do you see what I mean? Where you can't tell where does the collage end and the painting end and so on. Right. right. I yeah. love the stitching too. It's beautiful. Thank you. We will take well, one, I... more, one more share. Barbara, would you like to share? Yeah, I'm trying to hold it up. I'm not. Uh-oh, you went black, unless I made a mistake. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. Did you just make that or you made that before? Yes, no, this is while you, we were in the class. Okay, and tell us about that one. Well, it's, I like to use tonal mm -hmm. and then I like to do the drawings over it and the embellishments of the ink. I've got some ink on it here. And then I would put pastels on it. All of my work is always uh, very abstract. 
Yeah, well, and, that's, yeah, that's a good example of how you're working with the formal elements of the the images and the materials, right? The browns, the beiges, the lines, the blacks, the neutrals, the letters, right? Rather than right. the person who was doing more storytelling. So it's really beautiful. Right. I like yeah, it. and I... Yeah, you did some... Oh. It, it yeah. has to do with passage of time, I guess, is what made me think of what I was thinking about when I was doing it. I had found this one um, timeline. Yeah, I like, so. and also it suggests roads and tracks and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And the layering itself suggests time, right? Yes. Really nice. And that's a good example with collage. I mean, sometimes you can really get involved with texture when you are working with collage. Yeah. Shiny, matte, roughs, and so on. I and like the idea of the sewing too. The sewing. I use a lot of threads and I like to do boro. So I think, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, the sewing the is suggestion. a really beautiful element. So um, everybody, we do need to end. <laughs> I wanna thank everyone for coming on to Zoom. And, thank you. Um, thank you for being patient with the technology. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So Have a wonderful <laughs> evening or day wherever you are and check back to pkhouse.org for our future programs or any other information. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks thank very you. much. Thank you.